New Bethel. Are you all awake? <laughs> Are you joyful this morning? Or has the weather got you down? It, it will do that, won't it? Won't. Let's, let's stand and sing, This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's page 657 in the book, if you don't know it, but most of us should know it. This is, this is. for a moment and Larry and Tony have some announcements for us. I'm just here to remind you that Just Faith starts this coming Sunday at 5 p.m. There are two, two more slots open. So, um, and I have invited, personally invited more than two other people. So, uh, if you want to join us, this is a conversation, I think, that is germane to what's going on in our church and our country, and we need to have it. So join us uh, September the 11th at 5 p.m. Thank you. Call the office. Good morning. Uh, similarly, we are going to be hosting a uh, Bible study study on September 11th immediately following church services. Um, it's three consecutive weeks, the 11th, the 18th, and the 25th. Uh, I've also personally invited a handful of people, but one invited the entire church. It'll be immediately following church services at 1015. There's two points to that. One is hopefully you'll be here. Two, it's going to keep Pastor Penny on track. Um, you mean on time? Both. Uh, and our top, we're going to start with something real simple because we're hoping to uh, expand this so that it will continue to grow. Uh, our, our topic is going to be forgiveness, so real straightforward, uh, and we're going to start by forgiving everyone who doesn't come, <laughs> and then within that, we're going to start by forgiving me for leading the thing. Um, but September 11th, the 18th, and 25th, and for anyone who has little children, Pastor Penny has a plan for uh, an activity for the kids, so if you want to bring your grandchildren or your children, we'd love to have you, so hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, Jordan. Um, Troy, I'm sorry. <clears throat> well, it's nice to be here this morning, and you've already had a great time singing, so let's stand and sing our opening hymn, Forward Through the Ages.
Thank you. Um, if you look on that same page, if you had your hymnals open, um, to 556, we have this beautiful litany for Christian unity. And it's kind of a responsive reading. Um, I will read the regular print, and the congregation responds in the bolder print, okay? Um, but think about these words as we say them. We are um, asking God, beseeching God to help us build unity in our world. It's something that we need, amen? All right. Let us ask the Lord to strengthen in all Christians faith in Christ, the Savior of the world. Let us ask the Lord to sustain and guide Christians with his gifts along the way to full unity. Let us ask the Lord for the gift of unity and peace for the world. Would you pray with me? We ask you, O Lord, for the gifts of your Holy Spirit. Enable us to penetrate the depth of the whole truth and grant that we may share with others the goods you have put at our disposal. Teach us to overcome divisions. Send us your spirit to lead to full unity your sons and daughters in full charity, in obedience to your will, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Do you know who wrote that? Pope John Paul II wrote that many years ago. Very cool. All right. At this time, uh, we have a special announcement. Sonny and Lucas, if you guys want to step over here. Um. Hello. <laughs> Big hello. Um, as all of you know, this is Sonny. Um, and I am Lucas, um, who Howard, um, as I was getting to know everybody, um, kind of shackled me to the tech booth back there. So. Um, I only get to see the back of your heads and only the front of your heads every once in a while, like this time. And today we have a very joyous announcement to make. Sonny and I are finally getting married after our trip to Korea. So. Thank you. Um, yes, we got all of our parents' approvals. And so... <laughs> So we will be getting married here on October 15th at 11 a.m. And Pastor Penny will be overseeing our marriage. And we would like to invite all of the congregation to come to our wedding. Um, yeah, and then... <laughs> Kathy was uh, very nice and she printed out a, an RSVP list um, that's in the lobby desk. And when you go out, you'll have the option to kind of check or, or X out, like if you want to come or not. <laughs> so that, you know, we know how many plates we need to get and how many cups we need to get. It's all the logistics now. And frankly, it's a little overwhelming, but Sonny has it, Sonny has it all figured out. I just, <laughs> I just do what she tells me to do. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're hoping everybody can come. Then October 15th, 11 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, the, um, they will be preparing some of the food that they want to serve at the reception, and that's why they need kind of the head count. So um, we're very excited for them, and uh, I know that they appreciate your love and support. Um, it's my understanding, Lucas, your families will not be be coming over here for the wedding, right? They will, not be coming. they will not be coming. And so we are their family here in the U.S. And so it's, it's kind of important um, for you to support them, for us to, to love on them and participate in that as best we can. So thank you for your support. Um, as we come to this time of prayer, we invite you to um, take a moment, a few moments to, to speak to Jesus privately and, and share with him what's on your heart. Um, what you need, what you're thankful for, and then uh, I will lead, a, lead us in, a, in another uh, corporate prayer. So let's come before the Lord. It is a day. It is a beautiful day. It is a day that the Lord has made, and we are joyful. We have much to be thankful for, much to celebrate, and we also have many needs. Let's come to Jesus and tell him.
Oh, gracious and loving God, we do thank you for this opportunity to gather together in worship on this Labor Day weekend. Um, Lord, we are aware of the many blessings that you pour out upon us, even as we're aware that our world still has many needs, that there is still dissension, there is violence, there is pain, and there is sin. We're aware of that, Lord. But as Christians, we are constantly, almost daily, renewed in our hope and our faith that together we can make a difference. We can help others. We can point them to Jesus. We can help our friends and our families um, into healthier relationships. And, and we ourselves can grow and, and become healthier and more faithful. So day by day, our, our hope is refreshed as we seek to follow Jesus and to live our lives in his world, your world, Lord, in a way that makes a difference and makes the world different. So continue to bless us, continue to guide us, continue to challenge us, Lord, and help us always to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We will uh, pray together the Lord's Prayer uh, a little bit later in the service um, when we come to the time of communion. So we're not forgetting it. We're just going to do it a little bit later. At this time, we'll ask the ushers to come forward for the morning offering. Again, we thank you for the wonderful blessings, um, your generosity, the tithes that you share. And I do want to celebrate with you. I hope you saw that. We not only met our goal, we were trying to raise $4,000 for Habitat. Um, we had a last moment donation of $1,000 from one of our donors, and we exceeded the goal. So we've raised about 4,600. Well done. Well done. Praise to you, Jesus. Praise to you, Jesus. This will help complete the home that is being built for a second grade elementary teacher in Edwardsville. She's already back in school. She's already teaching. The kids love her. And she and her three children will move into this house when it's finished. Um, hopefully, uh, where's Larry? November, December, somewhere around there. So we keep working on it. And with your generosity, it's, it's uh, moving forward well. So thank you for that. Um, Lord, bless the offering and uh, use it to more good things. Help it to reach more people in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll stand and sing, Spirit of Faith, come down. Y'all help me out, because I'm not too familiar with this, believe it or not. <laughs>
Amen. Thank you. All right. I am enjoying this journey with Paul. You know, I've, I've been a pastor for 30 years now, a little over 30 years, and I don't know that I've ever done a, a series all the way uh, through Paul's letters. So this is, this is kind of fun for me. This is, uh, I'm learning a lot. I hope that you're learning some things. And even more than learning things, like just, just head knowledge, we want to be inspired by Paul's journey. And so at different points, you can see in his journey, in his challenges, in his trials, in his triumphs, you can see a little bit of your own journey. And, and that, uh, that helps us grow in faith. Um, now, I'm reading a book about Paul by Chuck Swindoll. And in that book, he tells a little bit, Chuck tells a little bit about he, Chuck, how he was raised. See if this is familiar to you. I was raised to be my own man, Chuck writes, to pull myself up by my own bootstraps, to lean on no one, to take care of myself and my family, to do what I believe to be right, to, no to ignore others in the process, and never depend on anyone, ever. Does any of that sound familiar to you? Just raise your hand if you ever received any part of that advice yeah, from someone in your life. Women, too. That's right. Don't, don't worry about depending on anybody else. You do it. Look out for number one, right? Be the best that you can be. Pull yourself up by your boot. What's a bootstrap? I don't know. But anyway. Um, we do live in a world that praises a courageous spirit of individualism right? And independence. And then Chuck, he looks back on that, how he was raised, and he writes this. So much of that is bad counsel. He's not wrong. <laughs> you won't find any verses like that in the Bible, okay? That say, hey, be strong and independent and don't rely on anyone else. Do it all yourself. I challenge you to find that verse anywhere in the scriptures. Nowhere in scripture does it counsel us to be our own person, to rely only on ourselves, to look out for number one, and to do what we think is right without listening to anyone else. God created us as individuals, yes, but we were not created for independence. I'm going to say that again. He created us as individuals, but we were not created for independence. Some believe that we have the power within ourselves to realize the best that we are capable of as human beings. We have all that we need within us. We are self-defining, and salvation comes from knowing oneself completely. That's a very humanistic approach with humans as kind of the center of all things. You'll hear that philosophy. It's still touted in this day and age. Others believe that apart from the power of Jesus Christ, we cannot help but live a sinful, fallen life. We are defined and transformed and elevated, if you will, to a better life by having a relationship with Jesus Christ, by accepting him as our Lord, and salvation comes from that relationship. This is the Christian approach, and it is Christ-centered. You see the difference? It's all about us and what we can achieve, or it's all about Christ and our relationship with him. Saul of Tarsus, whom we're studying, uh, in another week or two we'll start calling him Paul, but right now we're still calling him Saul. Saul of Tarsus started out with that more humanistic approach. It was all about Saul and, and the knowledge that he could absorb and the things that he could do and the level and the rank and the advancement that he could achieve in his life. He started out with that humanistic approach. He was strong-willed, he was arrogant, and he was fiercely independent. But 
But then after three years in the Arabian desert with Jesus, Saul began to change. We talked about that period of his life last week. If you missed that message, if you missed any of these messages, you can go to our website and click on videos, and you can pick the one that you missed if you'd like to, to catch up. But Saul started out that way. He started out with a, a very human center. He loved God. Don't, don't misunderstand me. He loved God, the God that he'd been raised with. But, but he, he thought it was all about him and his level of achievement and that that would please God and he would earn salvation that way. But after three years in the Arabian desert with Jesus, um, after Jesus had spoken to him on that road to Damascus and they lowered him over the wall in the basket, you remember that? We had a cute picture of that. And after he went to Arabia for three years, uh, Jesus is beginning to change him. The Saul that we're going to read about today, we're still in Acts chapter 9 for the most part, but the Saul that we're going to read about today is still strong-willed, but that arrogance is being replaced with humility and an appreciation for others. Now, I said was being, you know, kind of like an ongoing process because Christian transformation is an ongoing process, and it happens over the course of our lives. We don't really reach a point where we achieve everything, right? But we're always in process of becoming more like Jesus and, and, and understanding and having more and more of our life centered around Christ and less and less sin in our lives. We can get better, right, through this lifetime as we follow Jesus. Um, and so it's kind of a process, but he is becoming less arrogant. He is becoming more humble. And he realizes that he can't do everything on his own, that he needs Jesus, and he needs others. So he's learning that. He's going to learn that. He's going to get a big lesson today in that. But uh, Saul was changing. And instead of a fierce independence, he was recognizing that he depended on God and the kindness of strangers. Now, without that transforming correction, think about this for a minute. Saul could easily have taken that fiercely independent spirit to a tragically hostile extreme. He could have become the greatest murderer of Christians that the world has ever known if he hadn't been open to God's correction, right? Who knows how many people he would have killed if he hadn't been open to God's realignment and correction of him. You don't have to search far in human history to find tragic examples of people who were not open to correction. In the beginning, in persecuting the Christians, Saul was wrong. But he loved God, and he was open to that correction. And when Jesus spoke, thankfully, Saul listened, and he changed his life. And, and instead of persecuting the gospel and the, those who follow it, he's now going to join them, and he's going to promote the gospel. He's going to share it. Beautiful transformation. Now, his conversion happened kind of quickly, right? Over the course of three days, he goes from uh, murderer of Christians to follower of Jesus Christ and joining the Christians. Okay, so that's kind of a quick conversion, but, but the process of sanctification in, in Saul that, that transformation of his character, that was going to take uh, the rest of his life. So, we begin today in Acts chapter 9. We're going to begin with verse 26. So, this is after he's come back from the Arabian desert. Verse 26. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. They didn't believe he had truly become a believer. So Saul returns from his three-year sojourn in the desert. He travels to Jerusalem, center of Christianity, home of the apostles, and Saul's old stomping ground. I mean, Saul knew Jerusalem very well. He went to graduate school there, right? He loved Jerusalem. So I imagine he went there with possibly a, a sense of excitement, you know, and anticipation. And This is great. I'm going to meet the apostles. We're going to all be best friends. This is going to be wonderful. It's going, to be, it's going to be great, and we'll all preach Jesus together. So I imagine he was pretty happy about returning to a familiar place. It's been a while. It's been three years. But he finds that the people he's wanting to visit have not forgotten all the harm that he caused. Right? Remember, when we first met Saul, he was holding the coats of 
those who were stoning the young Christian Stephen. You remember that? They stoned Stephen to death. Paul was there. He was holding their coats, and he's approving. Yeah, yeah, you got to stamp out those Christians, okay? Three years since Stephen died. I, I wonder how his family and friends were doing, Stephen's family. Hopefully they were progressing through their grief in a healthy way. No matter how your loved one dies, when they die, it, it's a process, right, of grief. you gotta, you got to spend some time. Um, there are stages of grief, right? And, and you got to work through that uh, and get to a better, brighter place. And, and hopefully they were progressing through their grief in a healthy way. I, I know that they were feeling the comfort of the Holy Spirit and knowing that Stephen was in heaven with the risen Lord Jesus. I mean, that had to help, right? Um, I want you to think for just a moment about someone that you love who's no longer with you. Just think about them for a moment. Think about them in your mind. Even for us, even feeling the comfort of the Holy Spirit as we do as Christians and knowing that our loved one is in heaven with the risen Lord Jesus, we still miss them and that absence hurts. Doesn't it? Now, imagine that you are part of Stephen's family, okay? And imagine coming face-to-face -face with the person that you hold, at least partially, responsible for his death. How would you react? Anger? Rage? A desire for revenge? Fear? If that person came and and told you, no, 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 you don't understand. I've seen the light. I, I, I'm sorry for what I did. I followed Jesus now. Would you believe him? Would you be ready to forgive them? This is hard stuff, isn't it? It's always difficult to change your reputation. And Saul had a terrible reputation with the Christians in Jerusalem. How many of those he sought audience with had a loved one or a fellow Christian that had been arrested by Saul in his persecution period, you know, or maybe even killed? If the rest of Stephen's family was still in Jerusalem, what would their attitude towards Saul be as he came back and said, hey, I've seen the light? Well, Saul tried to meet with the believers, but everyone was scared of him. And then a Christian named Barnabas, he went to Saul, he found him, he listened to his story, he prayed with him, and he believed Saul. Barnabas, whose name means son of encouragement. That's a good name for him. Son of encouragement. The son of encouragement became the bridge between Saul and the other apostles. Barnabas was Saul's way in. Look at verse 27. Bless you. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles, and he told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus, and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. And that got Saul on the inside of the group. Without Saul, many of the churches in the Roman Empire might not have developed as they did. The message of the gospel to the Gentiles might have been largely delayed. Martin Luther and John Wesley might never have read Paul's letter to the Romans and, and had their minds reorganized and their hearts strangely warmed. And you and I might not have his letters to read in the New Testament. Without Saul, there might not be a Penny. There might not be a Howard. There might not be a Bev. There might not be a Larry who follows Jesus. And without Barnabas, there might never have been a Saul. <laughs> Paul became dependent on Jesus in the Arabian desert, but Saul became dependent on others in Jerusalem. He realized he needed the kindness and help of others. Uh, when he met Barnabas, I'm sure it was a welcome meeting from Saul's perspective. Good old Barnabas. We need to learn the same lesson. We not only need the Lord, we need each other. We need each other desperately. Um, my uh, major when I was in uh, college was English literature. And so I, I read a lot of stuff, wrote a lot of papers. And one of my favorite poems that I've come across, I've always remembered this one. It's uh, by the English poet John Donne. And he wrote, No man is an island entire of itself. 
Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. As well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manor of thy friends or of thine own were, as if your house washed away, you know. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. And therefore, never sin to know for whom the bell tolls. What? It tolls for thee. <laughs> Are you familiar with that? It was written in 1623 by John Donne. When John was in the grips of a very serious illness, and, and he was experiencing this need for dependence on others, he had to rely on the care of others. And he wrote about the connection between all humankind. We need each other, and we need God. And that need for others only intensifies when the winds of adversity blow hard against us. The harder it gets, the more we need others, you know. We can't make it on our own. We are not designed for self-sufficiency. I'm going to say that again, okay? You and I are not designed for self-sufficiency. That is a myth or worse, a lie. We were created for relationship. We are created for dependence. And we cannot direct our steps in the right way without the Lord and without each other. And Saul was beginning to, to pick up on this. It's beautiful to watch the, the transformation in his life. Let's talk about Barnabas for a moment. I, I wonder what motivated Barnabas to take a chance on Saul. If Jesus had given him a vision, you know, and appeared to him and said, hey, go see Saul again, I, I think Barnabas would have told us that. I think it was more subtle, you know. I, I think Barnabas had the Holy Spirit within him. He was a good follower of Jesus Christ. But I also think Barnabas' action had to do with his personal character. You see, he was well-named. He's an encourager at heart. Do you know anybody like that? They, they always have a kind, uplifting, encouraging word to share. And you can go to that person anytime you're struggling with something, and they will say something helpful, you know, something positive. Barnabas was like that. It's just, it was his nature, his character, probably even before Jesus got a hold of him. He was just a nurturer at heart. And he, he had compassion, and he believed in giving others a second chance. And this is really important. It's important for Barnabas. It was important for Saul. It's very important for us. Barnabas believed in the grace of Jesus Christ to forgive people and change them. We doubt that sometimes, don't we? Be honest. Come on. We doubt that people have really changed, that they can change. This church is such a blessing to three groups that meet here in our church. We have a, an AA group. Do we still have two or just one? We have two Alcoholics Anonymous groups that meet here in this church. We have uh, the Al-Anon group, which is for family members of, of alcoholics. And we have another group, I think a fourth group that's just started, um, that is another support group like that. And, and one of the things that we're a blessing to them, they are a blessing to us because we're living out the truth of this faith that people can change through the grace of Jesus Christ. Barnabas took a chance. He became Saul's personal, personal advocate, okay? In AA, we might say uh, Barnabas sponsored Saul, okay? He brought Saul to the apostles, and he said, Look, look, fellas, I, I, I've checked this guy out. He's the real thing. He saw the risen Christ just like the rest of you. Saul is on our team now, so make room for him and, and relax, okay? The man he was, he no longer is. He's on our side. We still practice this today. New Christians, especially those with tarnished reputations, need sponsors. They need people who will come alongside, who will encourage and teach and introduce them to other believers. And so one of the things that you and I ought to think about as we study Barnabas' life um, and Paul's life, we ought to think about how can we do that for someone else. Or maybe you're on the other end and you need that right now. You know, how can I find somebody to sponsor me, to come alongside me and, and be with me? 
and encouragement. So whether you need encouragement or you want to be an encourager, think about that. What is your role? What is your calling? Look for somebody to help or find help. Look at verse uh, 28, Acts 9, verse 28. So Barnabas created that bridge, and he introduced him to the other apostles. So Saul stayed with the apostles, and he went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. For the first time in his ministry, so first time since he's been converted, Saul gets to speak freely about Jesus in Jerusalem in the company of the respected disciples. That kind of lends Saul some credibility, right? He's free to be himself for the glory of God, and it's largely because of Barnabas. Look at verses 29 and 30. He debated uh, Saul. Saul debated with some Greek-speaking Jews, but they tried to murder him. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay, well, when the believers heard about this, they took Saul down to Caesarea, and they sent him away to Tarsus, his hometown. Oh, that man just can't stay out of trouble, okay? Um, it didn't take him long to, to, to... He's such a forceful personality, okay? Now, he's learning some humility. He's, he's gaining some people skills, but he is a force to be reckoned, reckoned with. I like what uh, one of the Christian scholars in our disciple Bible study series, I like what he said about um, Paul. He said, love him or hate him, you cannot ignore him. <laughs> That's good. Well, that, you, we, we see this in Saul's life uh, at a number of different points. You just, it, the guy shares Jesus and makes enemies wherever he goes, okay? And so this is a little bit of trouble. In a later letter, Paul will write about this uh, period in Jerusalem where he got to preach with the disciples. And he tells us it, it was really only a two-week period, okay? <laughs> he had peace and joy and fun with the other disciples for about two weeks. That was it. And, and then he aggravated some of them. And, you know, the, the brothers, the believers came to him and he said, Look, Saul, this is getting out of control, brother. We're going to send you home for a little bit, okay? Wait for us there. We'll call you when we need you. That's, that's what he heard. So they got enraged by Saul, the Greek-speaking Jews. And they said, uh, Saul, you need to go home for a little bit. So Saul went off to Tarsus. <coughs> it was his hometown. And things did quiet back down for a bit for the Christians in Jerusalem. Things kind of settled down. And Saul, presumably, when he gets home, he returns to tent making. He hangs around waiting for the next thing Jesus wants him to do. And he quietly proves his commitment to the Christian cause by just staying out of trouble. Maybe he preaches a little bit there in Tarsus. It's always kind of hard to preach in your hometown, though, so I don't know. Maybe he didn't do much preaching there. Um, but this patience was another thing that Saul was learning. So probably after some awkward reunions with family and friends um, who have heard all kinds of things about Saul, he probably went back, as I said, into the family business. He plied his trade. He had a few conversations with people about Jesus, and he worshiped regularly. He was also waiting patiently for whatever would come next. In fact, Saul would wait four or five years before he got called up again. Okay? Um, verse 31 tells us about the church uh, back in Jerusalem and the broader Christian church. Verse 31 says the church then had peace after they sent Saul home. The church then had peace throughout Judea Galilee and Samaria and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord and with the encouragement of Saul no with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit it also grew in numbers all of this while Saul is sitting patiently on the sidelines the church thrives he was probably praying daily to Jesus, put me in, coach. I'm ready to play, you know. But he's benched for four seasons, maybe five. But not to worry, because the Lord was still growing Saul in his character, okay? He was still working on Saul. And the church thrived. What? Without Saul? Yes, without Saul. The church thrived. How can that be? Because the key to the church's health and prosperity 
was never resting on a remarkably gifted individual like Saul or Peter. The secret to the blessing and the health of any church is God, right? It's God. Eugene Peterson paraphrases it this way. I'm going to read that same uh, scripture to you, uh, Acts 9, verse 31, from the message. Things calmed down after that, and the church had smooth sailing for a while. All over the country, the church grew. They were permeated with a deep sense of reverence for God. The Holy Spirit was with them, strengthening them, and they prospered wonderfully. I believe that that verse describes the early church in Jerusalem in those days, and I want to suggest to you that that verse describes New Bethel during these times of pandemic. They didn't need Saul. During his time in Tarsus, the Lord showed Saul how much he needed them. It wasn't about independence. It was about discovering the value of dependence. Sadly, some people never learned that lesson. So Paul was learning contentment because he had changed his view and his approach, and he was beginning to see his life from God's point of view. Paul was in it for the long haul, right, for the end game. So he focused on what he was supposed to do, not what he felt he should have had. He didn't concern himself with his rights or what he felt he deserved. He just lived his life for Jesus, come what may. Another way to describe this is that Paul had his priorities straightened out, and he was grateful that everything, for everything that God had given him. Paul learned to detach himself from the non-essentials so that he could focus on what was eternal. That's a good lesson to learn. How often do we struggle with this? Oftentimes, the desire grabs us for more or better possessions. um, and, And when we feel that, it's really, truly, at its core, it's a longing to fill an empty place in a person's life. We think having that or living there or owning that or getting more of this will make us feel better, will we'll help us feel successful. And we all want that. There's nothing wrong with that. But a round peg cannot fill a square hole. And that deep longing in the human soul is fulfilled only through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing else satisfies that. So um, Jesus put it another way. He said, seek ye first. What? The kingdom of God. First. It's priorities, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all other things shall be added unto thee. We all want to find true contentment. For Saul, the answer came in in this this new perspective that he had, this this new priority of, of following Jesus, and it came in his new relationship with Jesus. Years later, the accomplished apostle Paul, this is years later, he's considered an apostle, and we're all calling him Paul. Years later, he would write this beautiful declaration of dependence on Jesus. It comes from Philippians chapter 4. And I want to read this to you in closing. This is beautiful. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. Oh, were that so for all of us? I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. He says, I've experienced them both. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being well fed and the secret of going hungry. There's a secret to going hungry. You just skip a meal or two, you know. But, but he's saying that all these things have taught him something about his dependence. I've learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. There's a secret to all of these things, and the secret is this. Read it with me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Who strengthens Saul? Christ. That's right. He can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. All things, like uh, flying through the air like a superhero or accomplishing anything you can imagine or becoming a millionaire, can he do all things? No. 
Paul has committed himself to serving Christ, and Christ is the source of his strength and his contentment. So the power that he has found from that union with Christ is sufficient for Paul to do all the things that Christ calls him to do. See the difference? It's not about everything that Paul wants. It's all about everything that Jesus wants for Paul. He can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. I love that. Our doing all things through Christ is tied to Jesus' interests. It was for Paul. It is for you and me. We are certainly going to face trouble. We're going to face pressure and loss and trials in our journey with Jesus. But in those moments, we will pray for help, and Christ will come and help us. He will strengthen us and help us persevere. That's Paul's realization and what prompts him to make this awesome declaration of dependence on Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Waiting is never easy, but sometimes it is exactly what we are supposed to do while God lays the groundwork for our next move. And if Christ is truly at the center of our lives, then life is never empty and resurrection is always a possibility. Next week, we're going to read the story of Paul getting called up off the bench and set into the game in a place called Antioch. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, teach us the value of healthy dependence on others and on you. We are not in this life by ourselves, and there's not much we can accomplish for your kingdom alone, but together we can make the world different as we share the good news of Jesus Christ. Teach us to humble ourselves, value others, and trust you in all things. To your honor and glory, and in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> all right. Um, this is the first Sunday of the month for one of our wonderful, beautiful rituals here at the church is to celebrate communion on the first Sunday of each month. So I'll invite the ushers to come forward who are going to help with that. Um, the communion, the sacrament of communion in the United Methodist Church, uh, a ritual is just belief acted out in worship, okay? Um, so the ritual of communion is our belief in the very real power and presence of Jesus Christ. We believe that he is the Lord and that he died for our sins and that through a relationship with him we are forgiven. And, and so communion for us is a very powerful means of grace and encouragement and forgiveness and fill in the blank, you know. <laughs> Jesus does all kinds of things for us through the sharing and partaking of this sacrament. So communion in our church is open. What that means is that we don't ask where your church membership lies. What's important is that you have a sense of your own sin and your need for the grace and forgiveness that Christ offers. If you would like to receive communion, you are welcome to. The table is open to all, even children. Um, they don't always understand exactly what it's all about, but Jesus said, let the little children come unto me, and uh, they'll figure it out as they grow, and it's good for them to know that they have a part. So all are welcome. Would you join me in the words of the great Thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread, 
He gave thanks to you, O God. He broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to you, O God, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here, O God, and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, would you pray with me our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. We invite you to come. Just come through the center aisle. Come forward. Um, we are offering... Communion by intinction. We'll give you uh, a piece of the bread. We'll put it in your hand. And uh, then you take the piece and you dip it in the chalice if you would like to have communion that way. Or you can come to Glenda's basket. And we've got the um, little self-contained packets. There are two peel-offs. One, The first one has a wafer in it. And then you have the juice. So however you're comfortable, however you would like to, um, this is a wonderful gift from Jesus to his church. Come and celebrate with us.
Let's stand and uh, sing our closing hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And I would, my prayer would be that you would, your soul would be well as we sing this song after having communion, communing with God. challenge each of you sometime today go out into the community and tell somebody it's well with your soul let's just see what they say hopefully they'll ask why and that gives you a window of uh, opportunity to witness thank you for worshiping with us today um, would you join me in our benediction go out into the world in peace Have, hold on to what is good no one evil for evil strengthen faint-hearted Support the weak, help the suffering, 
Honor all people, because all people are God's people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May it be well with your soul.